Hey everyone and welcome back to the podcast. If you're new, make sure you follow and if you like this kind of content, please give me a rating anywhere you listen to podcasts. That would truly help out my efforts in making this podcast. So last few weeks I've been kind of on the paranormal train and I'm dipping back from that and going back to true crime. So if you're with me, let's get into it. From Cape Breton, it's Saturday night. All right, folks, so what do you think we're gonna talk about this week? I have quite the story, and if you haven't been living under a rock, you probably know it. And that is the story of the survivor, Elizabeth Smart. I just finished reading her book called My Story, and Not only did she write it, I listened to it on Audible and she narrated it. So if that's of interest to you, I strongly recommend it. It was a really good read. I was infuriated along with her. I was scared for her and then I was crying at the end of it. So if you are willing to put yourself through all those emotions and live alongside her, as she describes from... The moment she first saw this person till the moment she was saved, it is definitely a tale that I just, I can't imagine any human being ever living through, let alone (sighs) rising above. So where does this story start? The story starts in the fall of 2001. So in the fall 2001, Elizabeth is walking outside of a store. She's just come outside the store with her mother. And I believe uh, some of her siblings may have been there. I may be misremembering her uh, recounting the story. But she comes out of the store with her mother and she's on one of the main streets in Salt Lake City. And there's um, a guy begging for money. looks disheveled, homeless. Being that they're from uh, the LDL, I think that's the name of the church. I'm not one for religion. I think I've gone over that a few times. But she's, she's Mormon, I believe. And anyway, she sees this person. Her mother really takes notice. And par for their religion, they truly believe to help out when they can. So her mother gives this guy five dollars and what elizabeth notices or at least she takes note of while this transaction is happening and her mother is giving him the money he's looking at elizabeth and it kind of makes her feel a little uncomfortable but she really puts it behind her and they go home and that's fine everything's fine well brian david mitchell That's the only time I will say his name. He not only took notice of Elizabeth, but he started at that moment planning to take her. Okay, so fall 2001, they first meet. Then months go by. So I believe this was November-ish. So let's count that out. Six, seven, at least eight months before her abduction. That's when they first made eye contact. June 5th, 2002. So Elizabeth goes to bed on June 4th, 2002, as any 14 year old girl would, with a safe space, sleeping in a room beside her younger sister, her parents in the home with her, her younger brother and older brother also in the home. And in the early morning hours of June 5th, she is awoken very tragically with a knife pressed against her throat. The bad man states to her that she needs to get out of bed and follow his direction. Otherwise, he's going to kill her and her family. Being young and very scared, Elizabeth follows his orders. So she gets out of bed, not wanting to wake her little sister, and she follows um, the bad man and his direction. So he's now leading her 
out of the bedroom towards where he entered the house, which was, I believe, near the kitchen. And at this time, he's got a knife to her back and where they need to navigate the house, he then comes to her side, but he does not let go of her. He has a grasp on her. Also growling in her ear that if she makes any noise, makes any movement to get away, he will catch her, he will kill her, and he will kill her whole family. Talk about a rude awakening for this very young child. So in the early morning hours, not only does she get awoken by this, she then has to climb with him for hours upon hours up a mountain to their reclusive, secluded, very primal, very dirty and limited with rations camp. I'm not going to go into the actual what happened directly there. You can listen to Elizabeth tell that story. That's definitely her story to tell. June 14th, 2002, just a short nine days later, the police arrested a potential suspect. So they arrest this Richard Ricci and he looks good for the crime of taking Elizabeth, but there's no, there's no proof in that. So he is, um, he's let go for that. All right. This story is absolutely terrible. I really don't want to go chronological and break it down that way, but because she deserves the recognition and for everyone to know her story, I will. While Elizabeth is held by the bad man and now a bad woman, she is trying everything she can, everything she, her little 14 year old brain can think of to reason with them, to not make friends with them. That's not the, the method she was using but really trying anything she could think of, anything that would come to her to have them see her as human, as having a family, as having relationships that she wishes to get back to. One of those she spoke of was her cousin, 15 year old. In this time of speaking with the bad man and the bad woman, the bad man decides because in his really fucked up brain, he thinks, that he needs to take another seven wives besides the bad woman wife he already has. After Elizabeth mentions she has a 15 year old cousin who's also Mormon, he decides that, dang, she's gonna be my next wife. Elizabeth immediately regrets anything she has said and feels sick, absolutely sick to her stomach, sick to her heart that she possibly put her cousin in harm's way to this bad man. All right. So on July 24th, 2002, just a short time later, like not even a month and a half after Elizabeth had been abducted, which by the way, her parents realized or knew that she was gone within hours of her um, going. Elizabeth had thought that her little sister did not wake up, but that was not true. Her little sister did wake up did see the bad man with a knife take Elizabeth. She was nine years old and absolutely terrified. She heard what the bad man had said and she had no idea if he fulfilled those threats and if she was the only one left alive in the house and what she would find if she left her bed. So it took her hours to go and notify her parents. But once she got the strength and the courage, she did run to her parents' bedroom and notify her parents that a bad man had come and taken her sister. With the small voice, she said the big words, Elizabeth is gone. When her parents realized and woke up to this, they decided to check around the house because Elizabeth was known to go in, out of her bed and go down and sleep on a sofa. However, the nine-year-old sister then states, you won't find her, he took her. So with that, the frantic panic set in and the police were called and that started the hunt for Elizabeth. Three days after Elizabeth was taken, 
she was in this secluded camp up a mountain behind her house, like very close to her house, by the way, just miles away. And she could hear someone calling her name. The bad man and bad woman were very scared that somebody was coming. And the bad man said to her, if you say anything, if you uh, yell back or draw him near, I will kill him. Elizabeth found out after the fact that it was her uncle. I believe she thought that during the, that moment, but of course she could not be sure. She was only hearing a faint voice call her name. Okay, let's get back to this. July 24th, 2002, Mitchell does go to attempt to steal or abduct Elizabeth's 15 year old cousin. He wanted a second wife to his third. He wanted another wife, another bride. He already had two. He needed seven additional to his first. Oh, what a confusing man. And he tried this insanity defense, but I'd like to call him a little cray cray. I think he was really deranged. But anyway, let's get back to this. I, I, I'll keep jumping off topic, kind of. Still on topic, but off the train, you know what I mean? Because this story is unreal and it always throws me. All right, so on that day, he did try to steal her. He tried to take her. He slit a, um, took the knife he had, cut the screen to a bedroom window. And as he was doing so, he ended up knocking some knickknacks or decorations off the windowsill, causing them to smash on the floor, which caused somebody to wake up. And that caused Mitchell, sorry, not gonna say his name, and that caused the bad man to run away. When he got back to the camp hours and hours and hours later, Elizabeth couldn't sleep, full of fear that he was coming back with her 15 year old cousin and it was her talking that got her, got her cousin into this. So she was sick with fear, sick with worry. When the bad man comes back to the camp empty handed, she's thrilled, relieved, and also inside laughing because the bad man says that it wasn't God's will wasn't God's will because you nearly got fucking caught. That's not God's will, dude. That's, you're doing a bad thing and you nearly got caught for it. I wish he would have. Oh God, I wish he would have. Okay, next, Elizabeth is still at this camp. Very little to eat, very little to drink. She's also tethered. She's tethered by a chain, like a wired, um, a wired rope, best way I can describe it almost sounded when she was describing it almost sounded like a, a dog lead you would tie a dog out with it was wrapped tightly around her ankle and then bolted to another chain similar to it that was also bolted in between two little trees she had a 20 foot span where she could walk even in the tent she was sleeping in she could barely get into any comfortable position because the chain barely reached to her sleeping position. And when I say sleeping, there was a lot of SA every single night. And this was to a 14 year old girl by an old dirty bad man. I'm just, oh, guys, I, when it comes to kids, how is he still alive? Like why hasn't he succumbed in prison? By the way, spoiler alert. All right. So coming on to the fall, they realize they're in Utah. They only have a camp. They don't have the things they need to survive a Utah winter. So they decide they need to move. Well, then they go to the library and the bad man steals a map because he decides San Diego, California is where they need to go. So off they went. They, they um, went down into Salt Lake City. They but bummed money. I don't even know if that's the right word. They didn't steal it. They just asked for money on the street and they got enough money to get a bus ticket, free bus tickets. Got them to San Diego. They get another location in San Diego, which again, I'm not going to go month by month, week by week, day by day here. 
But at one point, somebody came really close to the camp that they had made and he, everybody was hiding in the tent that they had built. Everybody being bad man, bad woman, and Elizabeth. And the bad man had his knife out and this guy who was just happened upon the camp was hollering out, hello, hello, anybody home? And he was about to come into the camp when he just miraculously decided nobody was home, so he better leave. It definitely looked lived in the whole place. So he backed away and he left, which is definitely something uh, was telling him to get out because if he had come any closer, the bad man was going to kill him. There was no doubt. Christmas rolls around. They are, I think it was Christmas day actually. They're out and they're on the street and um, there's a man that passes the three of them. And he's he sees them, he sees the condition of their clothing, the condition of them. They don't wash very often. They're wearing clothing that is stolen from homeless shelters. It's also stolen from uh, the homeless who have disregarded it because it was too bad for them. So they're really in very, I guess shambles would be the best word. So as they're walking down the street and this gentleman's eyes meet Elizabeth, bad man and bad woman's eyes, he gives each of them a radio and headset as a Christmas gift. Elizabeth is elated. She thinks it's the best gift she's ever been given. She quickly pops those earphones in her ears and tunes into a radio station The radio station is playing the best Christmas music. She's listening to it and she feels so blessed and so grateful because with these earphones, this is drowning out the incessant talking of the bad man, who by the way, from the time he took her till the time he gets captured, he never shuts up. He's constantly bitching at her, threatening her, or just preaching preaching his nonsense because there's no way God is relaying anything through this bad man. Not a chance. As much as I have questions about religion, I know that for a fact. So in February, um, oh, I just skipped right over that. So she has the headset in. He starts talking louder so she can hear him over the headset. And he's berating her, telling her how disgusting it is that she's listening to this music how unholy it is how this how that and just to shut him up she takes the headset and she throws it away the whole, the radio and the headset she throws it away so he smirks because he got his way and then because he is a fucking asshole sorry anyone that needs a little heads up when there's cursing but he is he is absolutely that is what he is he is devil incarnate but after he forces her through this gd bloody talking he whips out his radio and headset plops them in and listens to the same christmas music that she was just listening to now i know that's not essaying her i know that's not beating her i know that that's not shooting or killing her but that is almost worse not only you did you take this young child? You forced her to do things that she would never, never do, at least not by will with you. And you berate her, you do awful things, and now you take away any happiness she may have. You're the devil. I never met the devil. I only met a demon. You, sir, were the devil. So in February 2003, Elizabeth has been with these people now for eight months and she's learning a lot she's a smart i mean her last name is just perfect elizabeth smart is smart she's watching she's listening she's absorbing and there's certain things that the bad woman and the bad man really like and that's when you stroke their egos and when you make them think of things or think that they are making the decisions manipulation So because Elizabeth is smart and she has seen this, she decides to try her hand at manipulation. And in February 2003, they realize that they're going to have to move again 
because the camp that they are on, the camp that they finally moved to after the guy came into the first camp, by the way, they had to move. Um, I think the second time they decided to move, they were going to go to the East Coast. I think that's what they were talking about. From California to the East Coast. And she thought, hell no, I am not getting that far away from my family. There's no way. People in the East Coast are definitely not looking for me. Little did she know. No, everybody was looking for her. So she decides to try her hand at the manip manipulation. And so she strokes his ego a bit. And then she says she would think they should go back to Salt Lake City. She just throws it out there. Salt Lake City. The bad man knows absolutely people are looking for her. But what he doesn't know is that the whole country... The whole world, anyone that watches um, Most Wanted, America's Most Wanted, the FBI top 10 list, they know their faces. The sketch artist's rendition of who has Elizabeth, we're pretty dang close. So he doesn't know that his face is all over the news. His face is what people are looking for. So she throws it out there. They talk about it. And... He agrees, shockingly, he agrees that they should go back to Salt Lake City, Utah. Now, when they agree, one thing he states has to happen is Elizabeth's beautiful, long, blonde hair must be cut and dyed so no one recognizes her. And of course, this is heartbreaking to Elizabeth. She does not want her hair cut nor dyed, so she puts up a protest about it. And of course, he's not listening to her. This is his idea, therefore it is genius, therefore it must happen. And the bad woman actually steps up for Elizabeth here. I mean, she wouldn't step up when he was S.A. in her. Hell no. But she'll step up for the hair. Well, take any win you get, right? So she steps up and he agrees with the bad woman and Elizabeth can keep her hair, but she'll have to get a wig. Like, there's no way. Definitely have to get a wig. So they go to the dollar store where you can get the most exquisite wigs. They go to the dollar store and they get a gray wig. Come on. What now 15 year old, since she's had a birthday, would be wearing a gray wig? Well, if it was 2022 or 2023, probably thousands of them since gray hair tends to be in fashion now. However, in 2003, 20 years ago, it was not. All right, so they get the wig. She puts it on. She looks hideous, but that's it. That's how she's going. They head on their travels to Salt Lake City from San Diego. How are they going to get there? Well, they can't raise enough money for a bus ticket. That's out. Flying is definitely out of the question. That's way too expensive. So Elizabeth, again, with the manip manipulation. Oh my goodness, I have a hard time with that word. She suggests, well, you and the bad woman have hitchhiked all over the United States. I've never tried it. And I sh think I should try it. So the bad man thinks... Hell yeah, you're totally on board now. Yes, absolutely, we're going to hitchhike, dumbass. So they start hitchhiking. Not only do they have no food, well, very little when they start out, very little water. And because he's so fucking greedy, he pretty much eats everything and takes all the water. So they, the bad woman and Elizabeth, very rarely have any water or any food for this complete time, by the way. Not just... The hitchhiking but for all time elizabeth has had many instances where she's been so thirsty and so hungry it had nearly killed her so they start their travels they have very little they get a little bit you know ahead as far as getting down the road they get picked up so it goes days and days and days and days and days on their travels and Elizabeth is exhausted. They finally made it to Las Vegas, which is almost halfway to Salt Lake City from San Diego. 
which if you're driving by car, it's like 11 and a half hours drive, which is a full day's drive or two days if you break it up. But they're walking pretty much. I mean, they're hitchhiking, but they're pretty much walking through the desert in March. I don't know. I've never been to Nevada. I've never been to California or Utah for that matter. I don't know what it's like, but I'm thinking that the snow is probably melted and the desert's probably damn hot or cold, frigid at night. So that's just my take. I don't know, though. She didn't talk about that. She did talk about um, a few nights where it was cold. So at another point where they they leave Las Vegas and they're traveling down, they end up meeting uh, at a truck stop, a trucker that is heading north. So he's going to Utah. And when he, when they meet him, they ask if they can ride with him to Utah. And he agrees. He, first, he only wants to take the girls. But he agrees to take everybody. And the bad woman sits up front with the truck driver. And the bad man and Elizabeth sit in the uh, truck cabin where the trucker would spend his nights when he's lay over, pulled on the side of the road or at a truck stop. So they're traveling by this truck. They get almost almost to salt lake city like just miles away and the truck driver releases them out of the truck that's the end of the road for him so they get out of the truck and almost immediately things start to happen they do take a bus into downtown salt lake city so they get on the bus, and as they're on the bus, it's pretty much standing room, and there's this guy just staring at them. And that was normal. They look so yucky and disheveled. Pretty much everybody stared at them. And here's a young 15-year-old girl, a young girl wearing a gray wig, bad wig at that. So of course she's getting stared at. They're dirty. They smell. So this guy is, like, intently staring. And he comes up to them and he starts asking questions. The bad man's really annoyed with this. He's really not liking the fact that somebody's asking questions. He's kind of saying under his breath or by the look of him, we shouldn't have fucking done this. This is not right. We are in trouble. We need to get off this bus. So the next stop, they get off and they go to get another bus. They're on, oh, what street was it? State Street, I think it was called, if I remember correctly. And again, this is March 2003. I think it was March 12th, one, two, March 12th. And they get off the bus and they're walking down the street. They got rucksacks with them and they start walking. And Elizabeth has her eyes down, her head down. And a few blocks away, as they start walking, the first police car pulls up, then the second, then the third, then their route is blocked by another police car. And police people, I'm not sure if they were men or women, so let's say police people, were approaching the bad man, the bad woman, and Elizabeth starts speaking to the bad man, asking for ID, asking who he is. And of course, the bad man, using God, using the fact that he's a preacher or whatever he, rubbish he says, tries to get out of it. But these cops are not playing. They are not. They, they know what's up. They've got this figured out. Now, she didn't say in the book that it was the guy on the bus that called the cops. But I'm thinking it was probably the guy on the bus that recognized Elizabeth and these two from America's Most Wanted and called the cops and said they're heading this way on this street. So one of the cops comes up to Elizabeth and asks who she is and she won't answer. She is terrified. By the way, 
this is not the first time Elizabeth has had an opportunity to run. Many people have criticized her since her um, escape from this. But let me be clear. No way in this world was she ever at fault for not running. We have a 14 year old girl who was kidnapped at knife point from her bed in her house, told every single day that if she tried anything, if she said anything, if she even attempted to run, he would not only capture her and kill her, he would then go to her house, get in her house, and kill her whole family. She feared through every ounce of her being that he would do it. So through that fear, she kept her mouth shut and her eyes down. He had full control because of her fear. And it was this fear keeping her from speaking on this day. It was another police person who recognized the fear, pulled the police officer back and said, she's scared. We need to separate them because she is terrified of him. So that's what they did. They arrested everybody, including Elizabeth. They put her in handcuffs and put her in the back of a police vehicle. They took the bad man and bad woman to one police station and they took Elizabeth to another. Elizabeth was terrified. She had no idea what she had done wrong. She had no idea where she was going. She, all she knew was if she said anything that the bad man would be angry and kill her and her family. So on the way to the police station, she was unbearably terrified. She gets to the police station and she gets into a solid, a room with no windows, uh, interrogation room, I guess it would be. I've never been in one, so I have no idea. And they remove the handcuffs and they start asking her, are you Elizabeth? Actually, I think on the street they asked her that. Are you Elizabeth Smart? And she finally got up the courage to say in a very small voice, I am Elizabeth. So they had her state this. Then the next thing she knows, she's in this room, she's terrified, the door opens and an officer walks in and says, there's somebody here that would like to see you. And in walks her father. Cue the Kleenex. Seriously, guys, cue the Kleenex. It was a cry fest, not only for them, but for me. Oh my God, like just knowing that she was in her father's arms once again, that she was safe, that she was free. I remember this story in 2002, 2003. Oh, I remember it. I was only 26, 27 years old. I was heartbroken for her at that moment. It was all over our news, even here in Nova Scotia, all over the news. We knew of Elizabeth Smart. We watched the story and we were elated in March of 2003 when she was safe and at home. But of course, as a person just touched by the story, I too, just like all of you, I'm sure, were terrified that she would be affected by this for the rest of her life. But I'm happy to report based on her words alone and her voice, that she is happy. She has put this behind her in her way and she has moved on and she has a family now of her own. And I can't be any more happy for the successes she has in her personal life, professional life, 
and in her heart. God bless you, Elizabeth. I'm sure you won't hear this, but if you ever do, God bless you. And that is the story of Elizabeth Smart. Just to wrap up, the bad man and bad woman, they went to prison. The bad woman got a plea deal. Go figure, she ratted you know, him out or whatever she did to get it. So she got a lighter sentence. But he got 35 years to life. And let's hope he dies in prison. I can't believe he hasn't been killed already. I don't wish that on anyone. But this guy, this guy, again, devil incarnate, I don't know how he's surviving in prison. Maybe that's, I don't know. Like, just his incessant talking would have gotten him killed by now, don't you think? But again, I'm not, I'm not saying that somebody should. I'm just surprised that it hasn't. Does that make sense? All right, guys, that's it for this week. I hope you all enjoyed that story. I know it was terrible. Um, but again, her book is called My Story. I found it at my local library on audio audiobook. So I'm sure all your local libraries probably have a copy of it. It was written by Elizabeth along with uh chris stewart and it is narrated by elizabeth it is very good narration i was very intrigued of course the story intrigues me as well it took me oh it's about nine hours long the audiobook and it was published apparently it was published in 2013 i'm way behind the times that i did not know so 2013 October 7th 2013 it was published so that was just 10 and a half years after she was abducted or sorry found after she was found again great book strongly suggest a read for it and to keep this story out there there are many children that are abducted stranger abductions are rare and all abductions. I wish they all would stop. Harm against children is just unreal and unthinkable. Until next week, guys. I'm not sure if I'll stick to the true crime. Maybe I will. And uh, yeah, until then, make sure you follow, like this podcast, give me a rating. And if you're listening to this on YouTube, I will post it there as well. So I'll leave a link to the YouTube in the show notes. But if you are on YouTube and you have been listening or showing up on my YouTube to hear my podcast episodes or see any of my videos and you haven't subscribed yet, hit that subscribe button below. I would truly appreciate it. And like this video if that's the kind of thing you like. That way YouTube gets to share it with many other people. All that does help out, guys. I truly appreciate it. Until next week, take care.